Genesis chapter 11, just the first nine verses. You can read the further genealogies. We've been through quite a bit of that over the last week or so. It's wonderful to know that there are people tonight singing, blessed be the name of the Lord. In fact, one of our great friends, uh, she just made up to 90 years of age, but she died this week and she's gone to be with the Lord Jesus. And it's lovely to know that people that have gone ahead of us are really praising God. Sometimes we feel that you know, some of the singing could go a bit better and maybe if we had a, an orchestra out here, we might sing a bit better. But uh, in heaven, we won't have that problem because they've been singing for years uh, the praise of the name of God. And God wants us to recognise that in our prayers too. You, you remember... Um, Last week, I believe it was, we showed you a map of the family of Japheth. They spread, as you read from uh, here, eastward. They came from Ararat and they went eastward towards Mesopotamia. Now, that's very often known as the cradle of civilization. It's between the Tigris and Euphrates River. So Japheth's family spread out and took over quite a bit of land. Then the other members of the family, you remember Shem, Ham and Japheth. Japheth was the oldest. And then Ham, he spread out south towards Africa and parts of of Egypt. And that's tremendous to know that He was in that direction. And Shem's descendants, they went more to the Mesopotamian area and they stayed more or less in in the Middle East. So is a picture of the Akkadian Empire. Tigris and Euphrates rivers are very clear. And I always remember which way round it is that the Tigris is on the top. So Tigris, Euphrates. So I had to re- try and remember that at one particular time uh, when I was doing walk through the Bible, I think it was, and we, we always remembered it that way. And the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers are a fascinating area. You go to the British Museum and loads of museums around the world and you'll find lots and lots of artefacts that come from there, lots of cuneiform writing, earliest writings came from that area. That's why it's called the Cradle of Civilization. It's above the Persian Gulf. And it's interesting, isn't it, that that area is very crucial in the news today. The whole of that area is very, very important and has been for years. In verse 4, the people say, come, let us build ourselves a city. Now, God didn't want them to build a city. He wanted them to be uh, pastoral people. He wanted them to remain as people that just spread out wide over the earth and repopulated the earth. But these people decided, no, we're going we're to go to the city. Now, if you know anything about uh, big cities, some of us have lived in big cities. I was born in a big city. <laughs> And in a big city, you learn to lock your door. You learn to lock your car. I haven't locked my car here because we're in the country and nobody's going to nick my car. I probably wouldn't want it anyway. But uh, there, we all locked our car. And when I first came to Newant, I was was amazed that people were turning up and just slamming the door and walking away, leaving the car unlocked because there's a different culture. The further you go into cities, it gets more and more difficult sometimes. The violence is higher. The crime is higher. And God wanted people to spread out and have a patriarchal society where the fathers looked after the family and the grandfathers looked after their whole family and it spread out from there. But they decided, no, we're going to build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to heaven. 
don't know whether you heard the news today, but uh, a piece of a space, like a module, I suppose, of a, of, a, of a space station was sent up into the atmosphere, or beyond the atmosphere today. It was the second module of a space station that is called Heavenly Palace. <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? The names they give these things. It's not really that big. I'll show you something a little bit bigger later on. But they reckon it'll be about 211 to 280 miles above the Earth, sort of where we put our satellites most of the time. And it will last about 10 to 15 years, and then... Uh, it'll come back down. Hopefully, they'll take the astronauts off before it decides to pack up. But that went up today. Heavenly palace. Mankind has had this sort of attitude all the time. They're reaching for God. They want to become better than God. They want to replace God, basically. You've only got to look at politicians around the world, especially people that take over countries and rule them, they decide that they want to be, well, virtually worshipped as gods themselves. So this is the first description of an inclusive gathering for worship, like uh, we are tonight. But it's not an act of worship. It was an act of defiance. They were actually saying, we want to be God, and we don't care about him anymore. <coughs> you notice in that verse that they wanted to make a city, they wanted to make a tower, and they wanted to make a name, a name for themselves. Not the name of God, not blessed be the name of, of the Lord who created the whole world and had done so fairly recently. And remember, these people were... The descendants, and some of them were still alive, that have been on the ark. And they're still around, telling people, but people are turning away from God already. And it seems absolutely tragic that these sort of things happen. But that's the way human beings very often go. And they, they didn't want to be fruitful and replenish the earth. They didn't want to spread far, they wanted to stay together and God wanted to separate them. So he had to come down and separate their language. And you know what happens when you can't speak the same language. Uh, you've only got to go up to Newcastle or something like that and, and you, you realise what on earth did he say? And sometimes uh, even uh, in your own country you can't understand the dialects. But if people's languages are changed, as God did so in, in that time. They couldn't cooperate together. When you've got one language, well, you think of the Americans and the British. Uh, we all speak English, sort of, same language, uh, but not quite the same vocabulary. But, you know, if you had the same language and the same vocabulary, uh, then the communication would be fine. But as soon as you start moving away, as the Americans did from us, their language began to change. But there is a similarity there. And God wants us to recognise that he stepped in because people were going to get more and more uh, ambitious as regards the things that they were going to do. And he slowed down the whole process by confusing their language. And, and of course, then they did start to separate. And we've seen on the, the maps just exactly where they've moved to. There's a painting of the guy that we, we met in, in chapter 9. His name was Nimrod. Uh, I don't know whether he looked like this or not, but uh, this is a painting that was made in 1832 by David Scott. Uh, this guy was a real, well, the first real tyrant, the first dictator, a mighty man. Not just that it says he's a mighty hunter, but it wasn't just hunting animals. He was hunting human beings as well. He was a tyrant. Now, we know that those sort of people are still around today, killing, maiming, bombing, 
stealing, doing that sort of thing. It's something that hasn't gone away. Who was this man called Nimrod? Well, he was the great-grandson of Noah. So there's the connection. It's pretty recently they'd had the, the flood and the animals had come out and the people had come out and they started to multiply and multiply and multiply and decided that they would go to this plain of Shinar and they would make a big city. And in fact, they made more than one city. Nimrod went on to make others as well. The Bible says he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. It doesn't mean that he was a good trapper and he could go around stalking and, and get animals. It meant that he was uh, a person that hunted men and forced them to do his bidding. So Nimrod was the first tyrant, first of many. You've only got to look at history to see how many tyrants there have been. His name meant rebel or we will revolt. As you know from the New Testament, it tells you that sin is rebellion. Sin is rebellion against God. It's people saying no to God. That's what sin really is. And these people were turning away from God again after God had judged the world. You'd think they would think twice, or more than twice, and think, wow, you know, God has judged us and, and the people that were on the ark, they're still with us and they can tell us the story and we, we, we better behave. But no, they wanted to make a name for themselves. Remember Cain? He killed his brother Abel. Terrible thing that happened in the first generation after Adam and Eve. Incredible that that should happen so quickly, but that's how sin spreads. But Cain wasn't from the godly line. Remember the godly line that we've been talking about? The family of Seth were the ones that were going to eventually come all the way down to David, through Abraham, right the way down through to Jesus. And Jesus was going to be the godly seed of the woman that was prophesied in Genesis chapter 3. So Nimrod got a lot of people together and they, they conspired and they pooled their resources. They were all together. They all had the same language and the same vocabulary. They all understood exactly when somebody said, give us a spade, give us a, a trowel, they knew exactly what he was talking about. But once their languages were confused, then things got very, very difficult and they moved away and the Tower of Babel never did get finished. That was terrible, wasn't it, for them because they wanted to make a name for themselves and only got halfway. And there's a number of towers around the world at the moment that have got halfway up. I don't know whether they're going to get right to the end because some of them are pretty big. But you often see buildings that somebody has decided he's going to make a name for himself or he's going to make a, a great big uh, office building and it doesn't get finished because the motivation was something uh, to do with their own selfishness. Mankind was saying, I am the master of my destiny. Have you heard people say that? Uh, their goal, as far as the city was concerned, was a social one. They wanted to be together so that we can get involved in all sorts of nasty things, uh, good things and bad things. But we don't want to spread out. We want to be in a city. And the tower was a religious symbol. In fact, apparently at the top of these ziggurats that you get in this area, there were astrological symbols. I hope you don't follow your horoscope because this is where it all comes from. Right in the beginning. Incredible that people today will follow what somebody thinks <laughs> is going to happen. And the trouble is you read one magazine, it says one thing. <laughs> the last time I checked up as an illustration when I was at a camp, it said, don't, don't wear light green <laughs> today. <laughs> uh, fortunately, I didn't have anything green uh, and wouldn't have worn it anyway. But it was so stupid and yet people will believe it. 
don't know whether you know uh, about the Invictus poem. Have you come across that? There's the Invictus games these days. William Ernest Henley, who wrote the Invictus poem that Prince Harry and all the rest of them uh, picked up on as a name for their games, uh, he actually was born in Gloucester. And he went to the Crypt Grammar School, where my grandsons go uh, in some time ago now. Um, when he was 12, he had an amputation of one of his legs just above, uh, below the knee. And he called this poem Invictus, which in Latin means unconquerable or undefeated. And people say, oh, it's a good poem. You, know, yeah, it should, you should stand up. You should face up to what's going on. Well, yes, but the motivation shouldn't just be coming from you. This is what he wrote. It matters not how straight the gate or how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. This is exactly what Nimmon was saying and the people at that time. And the people before the flood were saying that. And Adam and Eve actually virtually said that when they decided to rebel against God's command. And we do it, don't we, as well. When we decide... To break God's law, we know we're doing wrong, and we, like teenagers, <laughs> who uh, don't want to be told what to do, they want all the benefits that you can give to them, but they don't want your instructions. And it's uh, unfortunate that that's the way human beings are. But Henley, who wrote this uh, poem, was an avowed atheist. So that's why he's talking about man doing what he, um, being the master of their own fate. I expect you've been to a funeral and uh, they've played Frank Sinatra's My Way as, uh, as the coffin goes out. And you think, well, that's, that's the attitude of many people. I need my way. And it's not good enough because we're creatures made in God's image. And we only can be what we should be when we trust the Lord Jesus and we allow him to work in our lives. There was another poem written by a lady, and ladies might be interested, and she didn't entitle it Unconquered, she uh, entitled it Conquered, and this was her verse that goes against what Henley wrote. I have no fear, though straight the gate... He cleared from punishment the scroll. Christ is the master of my fate. Christ is the captain of my soul. There's the difference. Who's the captain of your life? You or Christ? There's no in-betweens. People say, oh, I, I, I do whatever I like. No, you don't. You do what Satan instructs you to do. That's the way it's been, right the way from Adam and Eve when he tempted Eve and she ate the fruit and then gave it to her husband and he ate and they were rebelling against God from that time. Absolutely unfortunate for the whole of human life. So Nimrod was this character who had great power and his name literally means this, a mighty hunter in defiance of the Lord. That's uh, what would help us to understand this man. He is a mighty man, yes, he could get people to do what he wanted, but he was in defiance to God. And the building of the tower was exactly that. Josephus, the Jewish historian, reckoned that Nimrod was, as he put it, a bold man and of great strength in hand. His construction of a tall tower was insurance against another major flood in case God should have mind to drown the world again. It's interesting uh, that this Jew felt that maybe he was building this tower so that he could uh, escape the next flood. Well, God had already promised that he wouldn't flood the earth again. And now God was allowing a time of grace which still remains open for people today, 
for people to turn their lives over to, to God himself. Many of these tyrants that we see down through the years have, have built towers. It's interesting that the European Parliament has uh, a tower that's called the Unfinished Tower in Strasbourg. And it's based on Peter Bruegel's uh, painting, that was 1500 and something, uh, his idea of this building. And if you compare the two, it's, it's fascinating, really, when you think of the fact that we're drawing people to come together. Now, you may not like Boris. <laughs> you may have, have voted against Brexit. But in a way, I, I feel happy that we're out from under this group that's going to get closer and closer together. It's going to be a political union, isn't it, in the end? And there'll be uh, a president of, of Europe, I expect, uh, or a, hopefully not a dictator of Europe. We're seeing many of those around <laughs> in these days. In fact, uh, if you check up on the EU flag, it says, Europe, many tongues, one voice. So you're drawing, going against what God has planned, reversing uh, what had happened many years ago. If you don't believe me about the buildings, have a look at these four buildings. Some of us possibly have been to the top of the Empire State. Anybody been to the top of Empire State? It's fascinating. You look down, ah, and the whole thing sways about 11 or 12 feet. This is made of steel. I used to be a structural engineer, so I'm, I love steel, but I'm not so sure about concrete. But they tend to build things that go up and up and up. They're trying to make a name for themselves. There was a big contest between the Chrysler building and the Empire State Building. And of course, the Empire State Building is quite a, a small building now. Uh, it was built in the 1930s, and 30, 31, something like that. And uh, no big deal these days. Although if you stand by the Empire State Building and look up, it's a pretty big deal. Uh, I don't know how they managed to get it up that far and that fast, but they do. And the middle one is uh, the Shanghai Tower. That's 632 metres high. And it sounds pretty big, doesn't it? Then there's one in Kuala Lumpur, the Medica 118. It's got 118 storeys. And that's eight, uh, 679 metres high. But of course, you've all seen pictures of the Khalifa Tower, which goes up to 828 metres high. Currently, the world's tallest building. My daughter went there for a holiday and spent uh, one night in there. I think it cost about 600 pounds a night to stay in the Burj Khalifa. And it's interesting that Burj means tower. And Khalifa is the sheikh of the UAE, and it's been put up in honour of him. So it's still going on. People are making a name for themselves by building bigger and better. And there's many, many others that are going on at the moment, being built around the world. Some have come to a grinding halt, and others uh, will be coming on stream very shortly. And the Burj Khalifa will be just a little bit, there'll be another one and another one, because we've got to be bigger and better. We've got to show how clever we are, how much we are the master of our own fate. That's why the rocket went up today, to make a space station, the, the heavenly palace. It's interesting, isn't it, the names they use. There's another one that you will not believe, but it is true, <laughs> I assure you. One structure called the space elevator. 
When they make it, and they can't make it at the moment, because steel is so heavy that they couldn't send a tether down to the Earth to actually tether this spacecraft. But if you can imagine, if you had a, a yo-yo or a number of string with a ball on the end of a stone, when you whisk it around you like this, you, you know that centrifugal force keeps it there. And there's a certain point away from the Earth where you, you just get nicely fixed. It's about 20, 22,000 miles. They're talking about a structure 22,000 miles away with steel coming down to the Earth, so it's tethered, and it will go around, as the Earth goes around, this structure will be there. And <laughs> would you believe they're reckoning it would cost $10 billion? Well, I reckon that $10 billion wouldn't even pay for the plans. But uh, that, that's what they're saying at the moment. Uh, and if you went on a trip, as people apparently want to, go into space, you, you go up on a lift, sort of lift, up the cable, once they find some material that's lighter than steel, like graphene or something like that they're working on at the moment. Once they find, and they will because they'll pull their resources, they'll, they'll want to do this, they want to make a name for themselves, they'll leave all the problems that we have in this world and create another lot up there or go on to the moon and set up there. And wherever we go, we're going to take our problems with us. We're going to take our sin with us. It's not going to help at all. Absolutely incredible to know that people would be prepared. It, this is planned for the middle of this century. And Japan and America and China are three countries that are working on it. That's what they want to do. They want to make a name for themselves. If you go on the, uh, the trip to the space station, it apparently takes you either five or eight days, depending on how fast you go, uh, five days <laughs> in a lift uh, isn't going to be that wonderful, but you will get out into space and you'll be able to see all these wonderful things. And people will say, there you are, we've made this. That's the way dictators operate. They want to make a name for themselves. I expect you uh, can recognise some of these characters... Nimrod-like characters have been appearing regularly down through the years. We've heard of them. We've, I think I told you the other day, that Hitler nearly got me when I was a baby with one of his V2s. <laughs> but uh, it, it landed in the next street and didn't land on me. These dictators are real. and <laughs> They cause havoc. And we're seeing it even in this time of... Uh, of, of our existence, that there are so many uh, di uh, uh, dictators. In fact, uh, this, uh, the map you may have seen, uh, was where the, the dictators are operating all over the world. There are places where you can say, well, that country is ruled by a dictator, that's by a rule. And then we talk about the free world. But the free world is getting more and more difficult to maintain. And even in our area, we, we tend to feel that we're getting lots and lots of uh, restrictions on our, on our lives. But remember, the New Testament says, and we've looked at it in 1 John, and we've looked at it in uh, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, that the Antichrist is coming to this world. That's what the Bible says. We've looked at the beginning in Genesis, the end is when the Antichrist takes over. Before Christ comes and wins, of course, uh, I love being a Christian because I'm on the winning side. <laughs> being a West Ham supporter, you're not often on the winning side. But we are people that know the end. We know where things are going. And God has got a plan. And he says to us in Revelation 3, uh, in Revelation 13, verse 8, 
All inhabitants of the world will worship the beast. That's the Antichrist. All whose names, that's the key word, have not been written in the Lamb's book of life that we spoke about last week. The Lamb who was slain before the creation of the world. So if your name is not in the Lamb's book of life, you're in mortal terror and, and, and danger of being lost forever. That's why Christ came. He came to show us that living for ourselves, being the master of our own fate, as we think, is not the way to be. If we give our lives back to God, then we totally fulfill Christ in us, the hope of glory, says the Bible. And that's something that we can always look forward to. We know that we're working with him day by day. So is your name in the Lamb's book of life? I hope it is. And if it is, rejoice that it's there and recognise that the power of the Holy Spirit living in you now can help you through any situation that you face. And we can sing in our hearts and in the way we live, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be the name, because he's done so much for us. In fact, our last hymn uh, is all hail the power of Jesus' name. And we sometimes forget just how powerful the name of Jesus is. The the Old Testament says the name of the Lord is a strong tower and people can run into that tower and be saved. But the tower we've been talking about never got built. And some of these towers uh, are just figments of people's imagination or they're going to spend mega bucks to make a name for themselves. But the Lord is saying to us, make sure that the, the, the Lord Jesus is your saviour, that your name is in the Lamb's book of life. And then you'll be able to live your life the way that God wants. So our closing hymn, all hail the power of Jesus' name.